to talk about DFT, which is a discrete Fourier transform. And you might be familiar with the discrete Fourier transform, you might be familiar with other Fourier transforms, which is really looking at a representation from time to frequency and then back to time, or you can sort of also look at what is frequency in space and other kind of areas. But start in terms of looking at it in time, and that's how we're going to talk about it here. And it turns out to be certainly a transformation that of x, and then I have these um, basically sinusoidal terms, which those sinusoidal terms, you know, I can talk about in terms of unit frequency, and that's turned out in terms of the overall number of points that I'm working with. 2 pi is the total distance in a sampled frequency space. That's why this is omega hat. And then I'm going to have integer frequencies from there. One of the things that gets interesting, though, is to start to think about these sort of transformations, um, and in particular thinking about not just a nice summation terms or things that sort of approximate integrals, but also think about it from a matrix formulation, because that gives you another perspective of what's happening. And if I was talking about it in a matrix formulation, what am I looking at? Well, I'm going to start off with having an input vector. I'm going to have a vector x. This is my inputs in time. And it's going to go from the first one, x0, all the way to the n minus 1 term. And so that's how I'm going to look at all of the different samples I get to work with. And then I'm going to look at the, then I'm going to look at the last one, the second one, which is going to be the frequencies. And I'm going to go from x sub 0, which is going to be effectively the 0 frequency, right? So omega hat equal to 0. This will be omega 0, and this is n minus 1 of omega 0. All this is good. And then I take this and I say, all right, how do I go from this vector that I rolled out? Because I'm going to get endpoints and I'm going to have endpoints as a result, or I start with these endpoints and I end with those endpoints. How am I then going to represent what is effectively this structure? Well, this is basically a vector matrix multiplication. So if I take the direct level of the computation, um, I can sort of roll this out as a matrix. This is going to be an n squared level operation for an n, transform, n point transform. There are some interesting routes, which is called a fast Fourier transform that moves that to n log n. That's a different discussion. But here, what you begin to say is, well, what does that look like? And what you see is that I can actually roll out a whole matrix of one, you know, ones. This is all the first one. This is the next row. And I get a matrix with a whole bunch of sort of exponentials that are sort of in a circular kind of form here for all sorts of different frequencies. And again, I could imagine doing this with a couple other discrete forms. In fact, I could have imagined doing this with just delays, right? That would give you a different Fourier transform. Uh, I could have imagined this in other kinds of forms. But this is how we're going to start with this one. And this is the one that you see most often. Now, this is all complex, so this matrix is complex, and I'm actually dividing it in a very particular way, because typically what I see for a transformation on time to frequency is I have no coefficient in front, and when I go from frequency to time, and again I can sort of roll out this whole matrix, I usually get a 1 over n in front. Well, I've kind of put a double square root of 1 over square root of n here. And the reason I've done that is if you actually look at these two matrices, this matrix and this matrix are now uh, basically just complex conjugates of each other, which basically means the sign change in the exponential. You're like, okay, that's cool, right? Um, and so I can then take the forward approach, I can take the inverse approach and get this matrix, and either way I can get sort of, a, I can sort of symmetrically look at this matrix F which is basically just the core product of it, and then I could just sort of scale everybody as needed if I need to do that, depending on how I wish to do the definitions. Well, then you say, well, this is really cool. This is an interesting matrix. What do I know about this matrix? Well, one of the things I know is the matrix is symmetric. I know it's n by n. It's square. Uh, I know it's a unitary matrix. And so if I use this matrix as I've defined it, it turns out that a unitary matrix means that the power is conserved. This is useful in a number of places where you want to not, power beating signal power. So taking all the inputs, squaring them, and adding them up. So the, the power of the inputs there, and then the power but just before the, that extra square root of n, is the power would be the same. So that's really valuable. 
It's also interesting because it also means that F and F transpose, if I multiply it, they're the inverses of each other as well. That's really useful that you can kind of go back and forth very, very quickly between these. And that's one of the things that makes these kinds of techniques very useful numerically is that I kind of have a known inverse. Um, it also turns out that my rows and columns, because it's symmetric, is are orthogonal. It turns out the determinant is always one, and the eigenvalues are always complex, and the magnitude is always one, so they're always around the inner circle. But this is a very, very special set of matrices. It's really useful. It's why it shows up almost everywhere. But once you can kind of see this in a matrix formulation, there's a lot that you can then start to put together in, the, in these various properties.